Praise the Lord, children of the Most High God. <clears throat> this is uh, Sunday morning. It's the day right off. It's a few days past uh, Labor Day, right? <clears throat> I've been working on this message for quite a while, as some of you might know, <clears throat> that I spoke to personally. It's been a battle. It's been a spiritual battle. It hasn't been easy. I don't know why this message was... The enemy's trying to keep this message from coming forth. But it was a message on uh, Labor Day. Right? We just celebrated Labor Day. And the title of my message is A Day When Laborers Do Not Labor. So a day when laborers do not labor. <clears throat> a Labor's Day blessing. It was Monday, uh, September 7th of 2020. And... Uh, for the last 125 years, America has observed this holiday in which we celebrate the efforts of workers by taking a day off. So the message is going to go towards that. Once again, a day when laborers do not labor. Before we go into it, let me <clears throat> introduce myself once again. I'm um, Pastor Robert Monson Jr. Uh, many of you know me as Pastor Jr. But uh, this is the Tabernacle of Meeting, uh, Help from Above. And our scripture for the Tabernacle of Meeting, Help from Above. Once again, we welcome you. As Revelation 21.3, that reads, And I heard a voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the Tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Once again, the Tabernacle of Meeting, Help from Above. Scripture is Revelation 21 3. And I heard the great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will be, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. The other scripture that we have is, is uh, Psalm 51 10 through 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Um, have you guys seen my messages? It's I always um, a quote on the scripture, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Right? Because many of our hearts are not clean. But here King David says, hey, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Why? Because of what sin he committed with Bathsheba, right? In 2 Samuel chapter 12. But he says, and renew a steadfast spirit within me, right? Because when we tend to not be in the word and not worshiping the Lord and we seeking God, praying, we tend to, to deviate from God's spirit. That's why he says, renew a steadfast spirit within me, right? So the, he, would, he, wants to re, he wants that zeal to come back. You know, if you want the zeal of God to come back, pray that prayer. Psalm 51, 10, 11, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. First, it starts with the heart. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Notice that. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Right? The joy of your salvation. Right? How many of us know that we're in the word and we're worshiping the Lord? We're seeking God in our life. The joy of, of the Lord is there. Right? But the enemy comes in. He wants to take our joy, right? Nehemiah, I think of Nehemiah. 610 says, uh, the joy of the Lord is your strength, right? So the enemy tends to take our joy away. So just be careful with that. So restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with the willing spirit. May God sustain you with the willing spirit. If you're listening to this uh, service, this Bible study I'm going to be uh, teaching on, um, I pray that. I pray that. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with the willing spirit. May God sustain us with the willing. May God sustain you. Sustain me with the willing spirit. Amen. And so, <clears throat> Labor Day. A day to honor uh, working men and women. The first Labor Day, the first labor holiday we celebrate, we celebrated was on Tuesday, September 5th, 1882. In a, in a New York City, in New York City, and in 1884, the first Monday <clears throat> in September was selected 
as the as a holiday called working men's holiday and there and there was a tradition of not wearing white after labor day, labor day <clears throat> but this fashion but this fashion dates back uh, to the victorian er era the wearing of white indicated that you were still on vacation so naturally when summer ended so did the wearing of white you know i thought that was interesting to read i just thought i thought i'd share it with you but um so but we're going to go into the word uh, deuteronomy chapter 5 13. we're going to read deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 13 14 and we're going to go into that uh we're also going to talk about you know our, 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 our jobs as Christians, you know, as we, you know, we continue to work. Amen. Our work doesn't stop. Right. But before I, I begin, let us pray. Father in heaven, we come before your presence, Lord. <clears throat> Lord, we ask that you would pour out your spirit upon this Bible study. And Lord, you know how hard I've, I've tried to put this thing together and you try to YouTube it so many times and it doesn't seem to go and but Father, we pray that your hand would be there, Father, and that you would allow it to, to be spoken as you would want it to be spoken, to be preached, to be teached. And so, Father, I pray for every man, <clears throat> man of God, woman of God, even the youth that might be listening to this uh, service, this sermon, this Bible study. Lord, that you would give them ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to receive your word this morning. Go before us, we pray, Father. And once again, we thank you for allowing us to wake up this morning to praise you, to thank you. Father, to exalt thee, praise thee, and serve thee. And Father, we not only thank you for allowing us to wake up this morning. Why? Well, because you've given us life. Genesis 2, 7 reads, that God formed man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And Father, we pray that we would acknowledge that each and every single day of our lives, God, knowing that you, Father God, hold our breath in your very own hand. And Father, also knowing, God, that you can take that away at any given time. Psalm 90, verse 12 reads, So teach us to number our days, and that we may apply our hearts towards wisdom. To number our days, knowing that the day of tomorrow is promised to no man. And then we need to get right with God and right with people and forgive one another. Mark eleven twenty six, 26, For you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. So, Father, we see the importance of forgiveness, of letting go, letting God have his way in and through our lives. To apply our hearts towards wisdom is the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding, Proverbs 9.10. Father, we pray that we would have that godly fear knowing that you see and know everything about us. Lord, that reference of fear in the sense of walking in a way that pleases you. Going about our personal life, God, in a way that pleases you. Father, when we're home alone and no one's looking in a way that pleases you. Father, when we're driving on the city streets or walking on the city streets, Father, in a way that pleases you. Father, walking into our homes, walking into our workplace in a way that pleases you. Father, walking into the DMV or walking into the doctor's office, wherever you would have us, Lord, in a way that pleases you. So, Father, go before us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, I welcome you to the Tabernacle of Meeting, Help from Above. I am going to start with uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 13 and if you will with me, turn with me to that um, it reads like this Deuteronomy chapter 5 verses 13 I read 13 it says six days you shall labor and do all the, and do all your work verse 14 but the seventh day is this, but the seventh day is the Sabbath for the Lord your God in it you shall do no late no work nor your son nor your daughter nor your nor your male servants <clears throat> a female servants or your ox nor your donkey nor nor your cattle or, your, or nor stranger who is within your gates that your male servant or your female servant may rest as well as you right and then verse 15 says but, and remember that you were a slave in Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Notice that. 
the Lord commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. <clears throat> Meaning since God permits six days of our labor, we should willingly dedicate the seventh to serve him wholly. Notice that. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 5.13 says, Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work. Meaning since God permits six days for our labor, we should willingly dedicate the seventh to serve him wholly. And so God had spoken <clears throat> the covenant words directly to the people and then and then and then then move everything uh, further he and then and then from from there further he addressed to Moses alone <clears throat> through his meditation to the spoken i mean to the people as mediator he gave he 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 gave him two tablets of stone upon which he had written the commandments Exodus 31 18 right so God had spoken the Ten Commandments and then he spoke to Moses so Moses uh, God would speak through Moses as, as as a mediator to the people which Moses hold on the, ten, the, the tablets of stone but um, once again uh, Labor Day referring to Labor Day uh, <clears throat> a prayer on Labor Day it says Lord this Labor Day pour out again your blessing and strength on all who work to make it possible for others to have a better life I'll read it again it says Lord this Labor Day pour out pour out again your blessing and strength on all who work to make it possible for others to have a better life notice that to have a better life let us realize that the privilege to work is a gift that the power to work is a blessing that the love of work is a success notice that and so let us see what the Lord has for us here amen and so once again the title of my message is uh a day when laborers do not labor. A labor's day blessing. As Christians, we are to be hardworking, but we all need rest. We are never to be workaholics, which usually happens because people start seeking riches instead of serving God. Right? I read it again. As Christians, we are to be hardworking, but we all need rest. We are never to be workaholics, which usually happens because people start seeking riches instead of serving God. And so there's nothing wrong with money. And even though it is hard, it is possible to be rich and to be a Christian. But let me read this again. We are never to be workaholics, which usually happens because people start seeking riches instead of serving God. And so that reminds us of King David. King David in Psalm 62.10, he said, do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope, or robbery. If riches, if riches increase, do not set your heart upon them. Notice that. Psalm 62.10 Do not trust in extortion, or put vain hope in stolen goods. Though your, rich, though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. The New Living, the new living Translation Do not make your living by extortion or put your hope in stealing and if your and if your wealth increases don't make it the center of your life notice that and if wealth increases do not make it the center of your life once again do not make your living by extortion or put those or put your hope in stealing right we used to say we say in 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 my, our Mexican culture, Hispanic culture, we say que lo, roba, que lo robado no sirve. Those who understand Spanish, lo robado no sirve, right? I think uh, I spoke this in, in our Bible study, and uh, we have Brother Jimmy, and he, he kind of like shared on that. The stolen goods is no good for anybody. 
but um, but we see here that um, do not trust in extortion. So David had seen men, men advance in dishonest ways, and he warned the people of this. So he saw that, uh, you know, how men had had advanced by stealing, by, by receiving, buying stolen goods or what have you. That's why he uh, David wrote in Psalm 62, 62, 10, do not trust in extortion. But as King David, but, but as but King David, as king, King David ended up being a very wealthy man, though most of his earlier years were lived in deep poverty. For David knew what it was to see riches increase, and he knew the he, he knew the foolishness of setting one's heart on them. And so we think of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter two verse six says, "Woe to him who increase, increases what is not his." Notice that. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 6 goes with Psalm 62 10. Who was Habakkuk? Habakkuk was a minor prophet like Joel and um, like Hosea. There were the minor, minor prophets. But Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 6 says, Woe to him who increases what is not his. And look at verse 9 of Habakkuk chapter 2. Verse 9 says, Woe to him who covets evil who covets evil gain for his house that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. What does that mean? That means that you stored up stolen goods and have cheated others of what belonged to them. Once again, you have stored up stolen goods and cheated others of what belonged to them. Right? So what are we talking? We're talking about storing up stolen goods right in your house in your bed woe to him who who piles up stolen goods and make himself wealthy by extortion notice that woe to him who piles up stolen goods and make himself wealthy by extortion so you're making yourself uh, rich by by extortion you know so woe, judgment is coming to him who increases that which is not his. Once again, woe, judgment is coming to him who increases that which is not his. So how long will he possess it? Woe to him who makes, who makes himself wealthy, wealthy with loans. That's how the scripture ends up in the end. It says, who makes himself wealthy with loans. So the scripture, Habakkuk says, how long will, will this go on? And makes himself rich with loans. But what does the Bible say? Have about, does it the Bible have to say about credit? While we see Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rich rule over the poor and borroweth the slave of the lender. Once again, Proverbs 22, 7, The rich rule over the poor. And the borrower, and the borrowers, the slave of the lender. Psalm thirty-seven twenty-one says, "The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives." Notice that Psalm thirty-seven twenty-one says, "The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives." Right. I think in my addiction, I, would, I borrowed money. I never repaid it, right? Because I was in my addiction, right? So I was wicked. Psalm 32, 21, the wicked borrows and does not repay. But that, but the righteous show mercy and gives, right? So once again, <clears throat> um, if you're listening to this Bible study, know that. Know that and meditate on that, right? Because if you've been born again, you've been born anew, right? Then the Holy Spirit will convict you of all this. So Matthew 5, 42, give to, give to him who asks you and from him who wants to borrow from you, don't turn away. For him who wants to borrow from you, don't turn away. But notice Matthew 5, 42 again, give to him who asks you and from him who wants to borrow from you, don't, don't turn away. 
And so, there's not a problem with having money. It's the problem. The problem is that it's not the money with the, the, the money, the man with the money, but that the money has the man, right? Is that the money has the man, not the man with the money, but that the money has the man. So the love of the love of money, right? First Timothy six ten says, "For the love of money, for the love of money is the root of all evil." Right? It's not having money; it's the love of money, right? And so, and, but but see, riches compete with our relationship with God. Riches compete with our relationship with God. But how does money compete with our relationship with God? It is not sinful to have money. But it is a sin to love money more than we love God or to love it so much that we don't share it with others who are in need. As we see Abraham, as we see King David and many other great men of God were very rich, but their riches did not interfere with their love for God nor for their neighbor. Notice that once again. It is not sinful to have money, but it's, it is a sin to love to love it more than we love God, or to love it so much that we so much that we don't share it with others who are in need, as we see Abraham, as we see King David, and many other great men of God were very were very rich, but their riches did not interfere with their love for their love for God and for their neighbor. Right? And so, what does that look like in your life? I'm going to share about that a little bit towards the end of this Bible study. But Ephesians 4.28 says, he who, he who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing good with his own hands that he may have something to share with the one in need. Notice that Ephesians 4.28 says, he who, he who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing good with his own hands, that he may have something to share with the one in need. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing good with his own hands so that he may be able to give to others in need. Notice that. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing good with his own hands so that he may be able to give to those in need so that he may be a blessing to others. Notice that. Are you a blessing to others with your wealth? But see here it says again, it says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing good with his own hands so that he may be able to give to those in need. You know, I think back in my life, I didn't, wasn't there, right? I wasn't able to give someone in need, right? Because um, I was in my addiction and my sin, right? But now, as believers, we're to be a blessing to others and we're to give, right? Uh, because God command, why? Because God commanded it in Exodus twenty fifteen, thou shalt not steal. So don't steal, but rather work and give. And be a blessing to others. Notice that. We see, we, the reason why we're not to steal is because God commanded it in His Ten Commandments, right? It says, because God commanded it. Exodus 20, 15. Thou shall not steal. So don't steal, but rather work and give. So don't steal, but rather work. So don't steal, but rather work and give. And be a blessing to others. Amen? We think of Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed in the renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed in the renewing of your mind. And so why are we not to steal? Because God commanded it in Exodus 20, 15, in the Ten Commandments. He says, Thou shalt not steal. So don't steal, but rather work and give and be a blessing to others. Amen? That's that's the word of exhortation. That's the That's the application. And I'm going to go into some other applications concerning concerning uh, labor and concerning riches. Um, but I'm going to continue to read. And so, and so, uh, 
There's nothing wrong with money. And even though it is hard, it is possible to be a Christian. It is possible to be rich and to be a Christian. We saw that in David's life and Abraham's life, right? Like I just shared. Like I just shared. We see that Abraham and King David and many other great men of God were very rich. But their riches did not interfere with their love for God or for their neighbor. So the love for God and for their labor, for their neighbor. It is it is not sinful to have money, but it is a, it is a sin to love it more than we love God or to love it so much that we don't share it with others who are in need. Amen. And so it's always sinful to love money. We saw that in Ephesians, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 6, 10. So it's, it's always sinful to love money. God does not share his, God does not share his glory, right? So it's always sinful to love money. Why? Because God does not share his glory. God will not share his glory, right? So it's a sinful to love money. Not only is it sinful, it is dangerous as well. Working too much indeed causes stress and health problems. How many of us know that? That work, <clears throat> working too much does indeed cause stress and health problems, right? While laziness is indeed a sin, don't kill yourself by overworking. While laziness is a sin, I mean, while laziness is indeed a sin, don't kill yourself by overworking. Never allow the desire of material possessions to stop you from spending time with your family. Notice that. Never allow the desire for material possession, possessions to stop you from spending time with your family. Never allow it to hinder your relationship with Christ. <clears throat> when you overwork, you spend less time with, your, with God and prayer. How many of us know that? When you overwork, you spend less time with God and with prayer, right? Because you don't spend time reading the Word. You don't spend time praying. You don't spend time seeking God. And so we see that. And so ask God for wisdom to help you for a good work ethic. All Christians must remember that God provides for us. Right? We see that in Philippians 4.19. And my God shall supply all, all, shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Right? And my God, that's what, you know, notice that. The Apostle Paul says, and my, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus, right? So know that God provides. You know that God sees and God sees, you know, your needs. But if God told you to do something, stop trying to overwork and do everything on your own strength. Right? Notice that. If God told you to do something, stop trying to over, overwork and do everything in your own strength. Right? We see that in Exodus chapter 18, verses 13 to 24. Exodus chapter 18, verses 13 to 24. Moses was overworking himself. Notice that. Moses was overworking himself. If you turn with me to Exodus chapter 18, we can read that. Exodus chapter 18, verses... Uh, 13 to 24 reads, The next day Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. And they stood around him from, um, from morning to evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, What is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as judge while all these people stand around you morning till evening? Moses answered him, Because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, What are you doing? What you're doing is not good. And these people who come to you will only wear themselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot do it alone. You cannot do it alone. Notice that. You cannot do it alone. <clears throat> so, when, so, so, 
So all Christians must remember that God is the one who provides for us. And if God asks you to do something, stop trying to over stop trying to overwork and do everything on your own strength. So here Moses answered, because the people come to me to seek God's will. <clears throat> Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me, and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Moses' father-in-law replied, What are you doing is not good. <clears throat> These people who come to you will only worry themselves. So work. So the work is too the work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice. <clears throat> and may God give you, and may God be with you. You must be you must be the people's representatives, representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them the decrees and instructions. Notice that. Teach them the decrees and instructions and show them the way that they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men <clears throat> of all the people, men who fear God. Notice that. Men who fear God. Trustworthy men who hate this honest game, right? We saw that in Habakkuk. <clears throat> we saw that in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 6. Woe to him who increases what is not his. Uh, woe to him who covets evil gain for his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. You stored up stolen goods and cheated others of what belonged to them. Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion, right? By by unworthy gain, right? And so here, here Moses is selected. Uh, Joth Jethro is speaking to Moses here. He says, but select capable men <clears throat> all, of all people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who, who hate dishonor's gain. We just learned that. And appoint them as officials over thousands and hundreds of fifties and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times. But have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves that will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. Notice that. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so, let me continue to read here. Let me continue to read here. And so we go to the next scripture here that says, um, hang on a minute. And so we look at uh, Psalm, we look at Psalm 20, 128. It says, you will eat from the work of your hands. You will be happy and it will go well with you. Psalm 128 verse 2 you will eat from the work of your hands and you will be happy and it will go well with you you will eat the fruit of your labor blessings and prosperity will be yours notice that psalm 128 2 you will eat from the work of your hands you will be happy and it will go well with you notice that so rather than trusting in riches believers are to fix their hope on god who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy notice that rather than trusting in riches believers are are to fix their hope on god and richly who on god who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy so one psalm 180 128 again psalm 128 you will eat the work of your hands you will be happy and you will it will go well with you what does that mean that means that you will eat the fruit of your labor blessings and prosperity blessings and prosperity will be yours you will eat the, the fruit of your labor blessings and prosperity will be yours 
And so, Lord, we pray once again, Lord, on this Labor Day, pour out again your blessing and strength on all who work to make it possible for others to have a better life. Amen. And so, we read this. It is useless for you to work so hard early in the morning until late and anxiously work for food to eat for God gives us for God gives rest to his loved ones notice that Psalm 127 Psalm 127 verses uh, 1, 1 to 2 notice what it says <clears throat> it's a Psalm of Solomon unless the Lord builds a house the work of the builders is wasted unless the Lord protects the city guarding it with watchmen guarding it with watchmen guarding it with watchmen will do no good unless you keep unless you unless you unless for you to work so hard from early morning till late at night anxiously working for food to eat for food to eat for God gives rest to his loved ones the Lord pours out his favor on our labor and establishes the work of our the work of our hands but when our toil is divorced from his providence or when we undertake the work in our own strength we discover the futility of our actions yeah when we seek to be independent of our of our when we seek to be independent of our of the lord we find it in vain to rise up early and to retire late in order to in order to eat the bread of painful labors for the for the lord gives to his beloved even in his sleep notice that <clears throat> i'll read it again it is useless for you to work so hard from early till morning from early morning till until late at night anxiously working for food to eat for god gives rest to his loved ones what does that mean that means that it means this it's what a glorious what a glorious to, truth to realize that the lord is not only the author of the beloved sleep that refreshes us daily but that he gives gifts to his beloved children <clears throat> even in their sleep notice that it is glorious truth to realize that the lord is not only the author of the beloved sleep that refreshes us daily but that he gives gifts to his beloved children even when they are asleep so it's it's senseless to work so hard from early morning till late at night toiling to make a living for fear of not having enough god can provide for his love lovers even while they sleep notice that god provides even when you're sleeping it is really senseless to work so hard from early till morning from early morning till late at night toiling to make a living for fear of not having enough notice that you fear so much of not having enough right but you continue to seek the material wealth you you know you continue you're working you're working you're working god's already given it to you you know you already have food right but people seek riches like we read earlier as christians we are to be hard working but we need rest. We never, to, we never are to be workaholics, which usually happens because people start seeking riches instead of serving God, right? So it is senseless to work so hard from early to early morning till late at night, toiling to make a living for fear of not having enough. Just how much is enough? How much is enough? Right? What was it that Bill Gates, Bill Gates said? They asked him how much, you know, the richest man in the world, right? How much is enough? He said just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Right, Bill Gates? I don't know if he's still the richest man in the world right now, but but they asked him how much is enough? Hey, Bill, how much is enough? He said just, just a little bit more. Right? 
um, Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5, it says, Do not worry yourself to get gain. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like eagles that flies like an eagle that flies towards the heavens. Notice that I read it again. Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5 says, Do not worry yourself to get to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes its makes itself wings like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. What does that mean? Working too much to get rich and ignoring the, the reality that riches can disperse, can disappear with the snap of God's fingers. Notice that. Working too much to get rich and ignoring the reality that riches can disappear with the snap of God's fingers. Does that speak uh, volume to anybody there? Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5. Do not worry yourself to get gain. I mean, sorry. Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5. Do not worry yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle towards... I mean, makes itself like an eagle that flies towards heaven. Towards the heavens. Working too much to get rich and ignoring the reality that riches can disappear with the snap. Can disappear with the snap of God's fingers. Notice that God can take it away. Instantly, right? What did Job say? Naked I came and naked shall I leave. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Right? His riches were taken from him like that. The walala, quick. Quick, instantly. Right? That's why it says here, working too much to get rich and ignoring the reality that riches can disappear with the snap of God's fingers. So be careful with that. Right? Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 12 to 13. So I concluded, there is nothing better than to be happy and joy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can and people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor for these are the gifts from God Ecclesiastes chapter 5 12 sleep the sleep of labor of the laborers is pleasant whether he eats little or much but the wealth of the rich will not allow him to sleep notice that seeking Overworking and not in, in the fear of not having enough. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 12 says, The sleep of, of the laborers is pleasant, whether he eats little or much. But the wealth, but the wealth of the rich would not allow him to sleep. The wealth of the rich will not allow him to sleep. The more, the more you have, the less you sleep. Right? You invest here, you invest there, and you're just thinking about your riches. You just man. That's why, you know, here, King Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 5.12, The sleep of the laborers is pleasant, whether he eats little or much. But look at this. But the wealth of the rich will not allow him to sleep. So how much is enough? How much is enough, guys? How much is enough? Hebrews 13, 5 says, keep your, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you and never will I, never, never will I forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5, once again, keep, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said what? Because he said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. Never will I leave you and never... Never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. So thank God for what you have and trust Him with what you need. Notice the application. So thank God for what you have and trust Him with what you need. Right? Because God has said, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. Right? Psalm 22. Right? When I do the communion, we think of the, of, 
of uh, Psalm 22, right? He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? So Jesus was forsaken on our behalf so that we will never be forsaken. Amen? Amen. So before we end, let me share one more thing. It reads like this. So why do we hear Christians credit God for their success in life, but don't hear them blame but don't hear but don't hear them blame him for their failures? It seems that God is always on the safe side. I'll read that again. Why do I always hear Christians credit God for their success in life, but don't hear them blame him for their failures? It seems that God is always on the safe side. Notice that. <clears throat> and so because when I fail, I know that it's my fault. I credit God for, for what successes he has allowed me to he has, he has allowed me to have because to do otherwise I could I, because to do otherwise could lead to pride and pride is sin and pride is sin and we look at Nebuchadnezzar's life we look at Nebuchadnezzar's life in Daniel chapter 4 verses 28 to 33 Daniel chapter 4 verses 28 to 33 um, once again because when I fail, I know that it's my fault. I credit God for what successes He has allowed me to to He has allowed me to have, because to do otherwise could lead to pride, and pride is sin. And so, our accomplishments, our accomplishments come only as a result of of the abilities He has given us. Notice, notice that. Our accomplishments come only as a result of our abilities, of the abilities that He has given us. Our accomplishments come only as a result of the abilities He has given us. Deuteronomy 8.18 You shall remember the Lord your God, for He has given you the strength to make wealth. Right? He's given you that help. He's given you that ability to rise, to rise up. So Moses speaking to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy. 818 it says you shall remember the Lord your God right when you enter that promise that you shall remember the Lord your God he's giving you the strength to make wrong right so why do I why do Christians credit God for their success in life but don't blame him for their failures it seems that God is always on the safe side <clears throat> so as humans <clears throat> we make mistakes yes under our own <clears throat> yes under our own power <clears throat> We do fail. <clears throat> and yes, God is always on the safe side because He is on the right side. That's why we need to be on His side. That's why we need to be on God's side. As humans, <clears throat> we make mistakes. Yes, we, <clears throat> yes, under our own power, we do fail. And yes, God is on the safe side because He is on the right side. That is why we need to be on God's side. Right? I think of Psalm 119, 67 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, <clears throat> but now I keep thy word. Psalm 119, 67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep thy word. And Psalm 71 says, Psalm 119, 70, verse 71 says, It was good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your stat that I may learn your statutes. Notice that. Right? Right? That's why uh, salvation is a supernatural act of God that produces that produces uh, salvation. Salvation is a supernatural act of God that produces change. Salvation is a supernatural act of God that produces change. Right? When we look, we look at Job's life in Job chapter 2, responding to his wife. Remember, Job was stripped from everything that he had. A very wealthy man. Uh, the only thing he was left with is what was with his wife, right? The wife that was supposed to be an encouragement for him and a helper. But look how his wife helps him. <laughs> you know, in Job chapter 2, verse 9, she says, Do you still hold fast the integrity? Job, really? Are you still going to worship God? See God? Do you still hold fast the integrity? She said, Curse God and die. Right? 
And Job here, in Job chapter 2, verse 10 says, You speak as a foolish woman speaks. Shall we only accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? Shall we only accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? Meaning, shall we only accept the good and not the bad? Shall we not accept the good? Shall we only accept the good and not the bad? No. From this, we realize that the bad things that come upon us is for our, is for correction and character building. The bad things that come upon us is for correction or character building. Notice that. And so give God credit. Give Christ credit for your accomplishments and take responsibilities for your failures. Give Christ credit for your accomplishments and take responsibilities for your failures. Right? The decisions you make today is the life you're going to live tomorrow. The decisions you make today is the life you're going to get. You're going to live tomorrow. So what life do you want to live tomorrow? Give Christ credit for your accomplishment. And take responsibilities for your failures. Right? God gives you a choice. In Matthew chapter 7, 13. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate. And broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there is many who go in by it. Matthew chapter 7, 13, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many, there are many that go in by it. So if you study Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, it says, Straight is the gate, and difficult, difficult is the way that leads to life. Narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life. Right? If your life is easy, and it's not difficult, then you not might be you might not be entering the right path <laughs> because like, being a Christian is tough, man. It's not easy. <clears throat> so study uh, Daniel chapter four verses twenty eight to thirty three. All this that came upon Nebuchadnezzar at the end of twelve months, he was walking on the roof of the palace of Babylon, and the king answered and said, "Is this not great Babylon which I have built? Notice that which I have built by my own power as royal resident." and for the glory of my majesty while the words were still in in the king's mouth a voice fell from heaven saying O king Nebuchadnezzar to you it is spoken the kingdom has departed from you and you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field and you shall be made as you shall be made to eat grass like an ox and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High God rules the kingdom of men and gives to him who he wills. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was, he was driven from among men and ate like grass, like an ox. And his body was, met, was wet. And his body was wet with dew from the heavens till his hair grew as long as eagles' feathers. And his nails were like bird claws. Notice that. Notice pride. Notice pride. Notice pride. Because when I fail, I know that it's my fault. I credit God for, for what success He has allowed me to have because to do otherwise may lead to pride, just like it led Nebuchadnezzar to pride in Daniel chapter 4, verses 28 to 33. So Proverbs 11, 2 says, When pride comes, then comes dishonor. But with, well, with the humble... Is wisdom. Notice that. Proverbs 11 verse 2 says, When pride comes, when pride comes, then comes dishonor. But with the but with the humble, but with the humble is wisdom. But with the humble is wisdom. But in pondering, but in pondering Psalm 127. Let's go to Psalm 127, 3 and 4 says, The psalmist reminds us that just as arrows, just as the just as the arrow leaves the bow, our children will often drift, even though they were pointed in the right direction. Notice that. Psalm 127, verses 3 and 4. The psalmist reminds us that just as the arrow leaves the bow, our children often drift, even though they were pointed even they were pointed in the right direction. Notice that. The psalmist reminds us, just as arrow, just as the arrow leaves the bow, our children often drift, even though they were pointed in the right direction. 
Psalm 127, verses 3 and 4. One, you can choose your sin, but you can't choose your consequences. Two, the decisions you make today is the life you're going to live tomorrow. Three, sin promises like God, but pays like the devil. And four, a man's way of sinning is Satan's way of running his soul. A man's way of sinning is Satan's way of running his soul. So be careful with that. Let us be careful with that. But let me let me read uh, where we were at before. Let me share on Deuteronomy chapter 5. Uh, look at verse uh, 14. It says, But the Sabbath day, but the but the seventh day is a Sabbath, the Shabbat, to Yahweh your God. The Hebrew word for Shabbat has more to do with stopping, with stopping or increase or or ceasing, ceasing than it does with restraining. It has come to mean resting, because the sens the sensation of work implies to resting. But note that these that these uh, verses do not require. The, but note the but note that these verses don't require that people work six days a week, but but restricts them from working more than six days a week. Right? These verses do not require that people work six days a week, but restricts them from from working more than six days a week. So overworking yourself, overworking yourself is a sin, right? But we think of uh, of Jesus. We think of Jesus was involved with the six day Sabbath controversies in which he was accused of overworking on the Sabbath. Five of these involved healings and one involved, one involved his disciples picking up grain on the Sabbath. In one instance, he defended he defended healing a sick man by rent, by reminding the Pharisees that they would that they would rescue an animal in distress on the Sabbath. Luke 14 verses 1 through 6. In one instance, he defended healing a sick man by reminding the Pharisees that they would rescue an animal in distress on the Sabbath. In Luke 14, verses 1 through 6. Another instance involving an accusation accusation that Jesus was working on the Sabbath. In John chapter 7, verses 21 to 24, Jesus reminded his critics that they would circumcise a child on the, on the eighth day, even if that happened to be on the Sabbath. Notice that. Another instance, not in... In, in another instance, not involving, not involving an acquisition that Jesus was working on the Sabbath, Jesus reminded his critics that they would circumcise a child on the eighth day, even if that happened to be on the Sabbath day. John chapter 7, verses 21 to 24. When the Pharisees criticized Jesus for allowing his disciples to pick grain on the Sabbath, Jesus says, do you, do you never read what David did when he, had, when he was in need? And was hungry, and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God, when Avatar was with Avatar was the high priest and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except the priest, and gave those to him who were with him. Mark chapter two verses twenty five to twenty six. Mark chapter two verses twenty five to twenty six. And then he added this principle that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Notice that. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. But let's, let's, let's speak about that. Let's speak about that. In, in John chapter 7, verses 24, I mean, John chapter 7, verses 23 to 24, Jesus answered those who accused him of breaking the Sabbath. If, if man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so the law of Moses should not be broken. Are you hungry? Are you angry with me because I made man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Notice that. Jesus answered those who accused him of breaking the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses should be, so that the law of Moses should not be broken, 
Are you angry with me because I healed a man completely from the Sabbath? Do not judge according to your appearance, but judge righteous men, but judge, but judge righteous judgment. And so have you, so as we have seen, when John wrote that Jesus broke the Sabbath on John chapter 5 verses 18, he was describing Jesus' actions from the Pharisees' perspective. Notice that I read it again. As we have seen, when John wrote that Jesus broke the Sabbath on in John chapter 5, verses 18. John chapter 5, 18 says, Because he not only broke because because he had not only broken the Sabbath, you know, when it when he makes that statement. He was describing Jesus' actions from the Pharisees' perspective, as we compare John chapter 9, verses 4, 9, 14, 1 through 6. John chapter 9, uh, 9, 14, John chapter 9, 14. So those who say that Jesus did actually break the Sabbath are, are green with Jesus' enemies. His accusers that Jesus, Jesus' miraculous works of healing, works of, works of healing were a breach of the Sabbath law. They were agreeing with Jesus' accusers that, that he was a Sabbath breaker to be, consist, to be consistent that they must also agree with Pharisees when they said of Christ, we know that this man is a sinner, verse 24, that the blind who had been healed knew better than that, saying that we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God, and does his will, he hears him. He hears him. Verse 31. When Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath, he was not violating the law of God by his action. By his actions, he demonstrated the true application of God's law rather than the Pharisaic tradition that it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Matthew chapter 12, verse 12. The law that Jesus violated was a man-made rule that was itself against the principles of God. Notice that once again. He demonstrated the true application of God's law, of God's law rather than the Pharisaic tradition. That it is lawful, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Matthew 12, 12. The law that Jesus violated was a man-made rule that was its that was itself against the principles of God's law. Notice that. So remember, Jesus Christ actually, remember, had Jesus actually broken the Sabbath, he would have been sinning. But the scripture says that he committed no sin. First Peter chapter 2, verse 22. He had sinned. He had not been, if he had sinned, he had not been, he could not be our savior. But he being undefiled, undefiled and separate from sinners, offered himself without spot and without blemish to God for our redemption. Hebrews 7, 26. Hebrews 9, 14. And 1 Peter 1. 1, he, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 19. So no, Jesus did not break the Sabbath. He spent the Sabbath preaching, teaching, healing, honoring God and doing the work of his ministry, the work of God. The record of scripture is that Jesus kept the Sabbath faithfully as God intended it to be kept. In doing so, he, he set us an example. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. 1 John 2, 6. Amen. So no, Jesus did not break the Sabbath. He spent the Sabbath preaching, teaching, healing, honoring God and doing good work of God for, for His ministry. For His ministry, the work of God. Amen? And so, and so let us end with this. Let us end with this. Let me find... So one more thing. I'm going to end with this. So thank God. The application again. Thank God for what you have. Trust Him with what you need. Give Christ credit for, for your accomplishments 
and take responsibilities for your failures. Three, am I a generous giver or a greedy giver? Remember that tithing doesn't mean that God needs your money. It's putting God first in your life. So am I a, am I a generous giver or a greedy getter? And four, Deuteronomy 5.13, since God permits six days of our labor, we should be willing to we should be willing to dedicate the seventh day to observe him holy. And five, these verses do not require that people work six days out of the week, but restricts them from, work, from working more than six days a week because much work causes stress and health problems. Amen. Six, do not judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds you plant. Six, do not judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds you plant. Seven, all labor that uplifts humanity has dignity, importance, has dignity and importance, and should be undertaken with painstaking, in, uh, painstaking excellence. That was Martin King Luther Jr. Eight, let us realize that the privilege to work is a gift that God it, that is, wait, take it back again. Eight, let us realize that the privilege to work is a gift, that the power to work is a blessing, that we love, that the love for work is a success. Verse nine, I mean nine, we must, we trust in God rather than riches. When we trust in God rather than riches, we have no reason to worry. Matthew chapter 6 verse 25. Notice that. When we trust in God rather than riches, we have no reason to worry. And 10. To base your hope on, on the uncertainty of riches instead of God is foolish. Proverbs eleven twenty eight warns us that he who trusts in riches will fail. 11. Give, give, give love rather than seeking to receive it. Give love rather than seeking to receive it. Acts chapter 20 verses Acts 20 35 says it is more it is it is more blessed to give than to receive it is more blessed to give than to receive so give love rather than seeking to receive it 12 sin promises like God but pays like the devil 13 a man's method of sinning he Satan Satan's method of running his soul 14 we are we are your light Lord let us we are your light, Lord. Use us to dispel darkness. We are your light, Lord. Use us to dispel darkness. John 8, 12. He says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And 15, I drew you, I drew you because I knew you. Always pray before you say. I drew you because I knew you. Always pray before you say. Amen. And so I pray that you enjoyed this study. I believe God has taught us a lot here this evening. And let us pray. Father in heaven, we come before your presence. We thank you everything that was spoken here, Father. We thank you that you allowed the study to come forth. And Father, we ask that you would pour out your blessings. And Father, we pray that you would uh, continue to give us that word of exhortation. Um, and Father, we, we, we just, we just uh, are grateful, Father, for everything that you've taught us this evening, Father. Go before us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you once again for tuning into the tabernacle. Amen.